Number one, they maintain the verity of the Christian doctrine against both pagan persecutors and heretical perverters and the purity of his instituted worship without the vanity of human inventions or conformity with either the droids on the one hand or the heretics on the other, with which sometime before the end of that period they were infested, chiefly the Pelagians with whom the faithful would have no communion but abstracted themselves in a monastical life living and exercising their religion in cells, from whence many places in the country yet retain the name as Kilmarnock, Kilpatrick, etc. That is the cells of these eminent men among the Chaldees. And their government also was that of the primitive order, without bishops, with little vanity but great simplicity and holiness. Many authors do testify that near about 400 years the Church of Scotland knew nothing of the episcopacy, uh, of the episcopal hierarchy until Palladius brought it and not without great opposition. Number two, in these recesses they had the advantage both of outward peace when others were in trouble and of inward peace of conscience when others were debauched with many conjurations and abjurations, co combinations and confederacies imposed and exacted by them that prevailed for the time whereby they might both keep themselves free of ensnaring oaths perfidious compliances, and associations with the wicked, and also entertain and encourage the oppressed for equity, who fled their sanctuary for safety. We find they refused to enter into league with malignant enemies. One memorable passage I shall insert, though strictly it belong not to this period, as I distinguish it, yet falling out within eighty years thereafter in the time of the Chaldees, it will not obscurely evidence the truth of this. Goranus, the forty-fifth king of the Scots, earnestly dissuaded Lothus, king of the Picts, to entertain the league with the Saxons, not only because they were treacherous and cruel, but because they were enemies to the country and to the religion they professed, concluding thus, Homini vero Christiano id lounge omnium videre, etc., quote, but to a Christian, Nothing must, seem more Christ nothing must seem more grievous than to consent to such a covenant as will extinguish the Christian religion and reduce the profane customs of the heathen and arm wicked tyrants and the enemies of all humanity and piety against God and his laws." Unquote. Whereupon Lothus was persuaded to relinquish the Saxons. Buchanan's History number 3. Though they were not for partaking in wicked, unnecessary wars without authority or against it, yet we have ground to conclude that they were for war and did maintain the principle of resisting tyranny, since there was never more of the practice of it, nor more happy resistances in any age than in that. Where we find that, as their ancestors had frequently done before, so they also followed their footsteps in resisting, reducing to order, repressing, and bringing to condign punishment tyrants and usurpers, and thought those actions which their fathers did by the light of nature and dictates of reason worthy of imitation when they had the advantage of the light of revelation and dictates of faith, the one being indeed moderate and directed, but no ways contradicted by the other. Therefore we read that as their predecessors had done with Therus, the eighth king of Scotland, whom they banished in the year before Christ's incarnation, 173, with Dustus, the eleventh king, whom they flew, uh, whom they slew, excuse me, in battle in the year before Christ, 107. Ivinius, the third, was imprisoned and died there in the year before Christ, 12. Dardanus, the twentieth king, who was taken in battle, beheaded by his own subjects, his head exposed to mockage and his body cast into a sink in the year of Christ, 72. Lucatus, the twenty-second king, who was slain for his lechery and tyranny in the year 110. Magaldus, the twenty-third king, slain in the year 113. Cor Corarus, excuse me, the twenty-fourth king, a lecherous ty tyrant, died in prison in the year 149. Satriel, the twenty-sixth king, hanged in the year 159. So after the Christian faith was publicly professed, they pursued Athrico, the twenty-ninth king, when degenerated into tyranny, who was forced to kill himself in the year 231. They flew Natholicus, the thirtieth king, uh, they slew, excuse me, Natholicus, the thirtieth king, and cast him into a privy in the year 241. They beheaded Romachus, the thirty-sixth king, and carried about his head for a show in the year 348, as they did with many others afterwards, as witnessed Buchanan, Book 4, Scottish History. Fourth, 
Whence it is evident that, as they attained, even in these primitive times, and maintained the purity and freedom of their ministry, independent of pope, prelate, or any human supremacy, that anti-Christian hierarchy and Erastian blasphemy not being known in those days, so they contended for the order and boundaries of the magistracy according to God's appointment and the fundamental constitutions of their government, and thought it their duty to shake off the yoke and disown the authority of these tyrants that destroyed the same. Yea, we find that even for incapacity, stupidity, and folly, they disowned the relation of the magistrate and disposed of the government another way, as they did with Ethodius II, whose authority they did own, but only to the title. See Buchanan in the place, be place before cited. A period number two. Comprehending the testimony of the fame Coldes with that of the Lollards. The following period was a fatal one that brought in universal darkness on the face of the whole Church of Christ and on Scotland with the first of them, which, as it received very early Christianity, so it was the first corrupted with anti-Christianism. For that mystery of iniquity that had been long working till he who led it was taken out of the way found Scotland ripe for it when he came, which, while the dragon did persecute the woman in the wilderness, did valiantly repel his assaults. But when the beast did arise, to whom he gave his power, he prevailed more by his subtlety than his rampant predecessor could do by his rage. Scotland could resist the Roman legions while heathenish, but not the Roman locusts when anti-Christian. At his very first appearance in the world under the character of Antichrist, this harbinger Pal Palladius brought in prelacy to Scotland, and by that conveyance the contagion of popery, which hath always been, as everywhere, so especially in Scotland, both the mother and daughter, cause and effect, occasion and consequence of popery. These rows stood and lived together, and sometimes did also fall together, and we have ground to hope that they shall fall again, and their final and fatal fall is not far off. Whatever difficulty authors do make in calculating the epoch of the forty-two months of Antichrist duration in the world because of the obscurity of his first rise, yet there needs not to be m much perplexity in finding out that epoch in Scotland, nor so much discouragement from the fancied permanency of that kingdom of wickedness. For if it be certain, as it will not be much disputed, that popery and prelacy came in by Palladius, sent legate by Pope Celestine about the year 450, then if we add 42 months, or 1,260 prophetical days, that is, years, we may have a comfortable prospect of their tragical conclusion, and, though both clashings and combinations, oppositions and conjunctions, this day may seem to have a terrible aspect, portending a darker hour before the dawning. Yet all these reelings and revolutions, though they be symptoms of wrath incumbent upon us for our sins, they may be looked upon through a prospect of faith as presages and prognostics of mercy, independent from his namesake, encouraging us, when we see these dreadful things come to pass in our day, to lift up our heads, for the day of our redemption draweth nigh. This dark period continueth nigh about eleven hundred years, in which, through Christ's witnesses, were very few, yet he had some witnessing and prophesying in sackcloth all the while. Their testimony was the same with that of the Waldenses and Albenges stated upon the grounds of their secession, or rather abstraction from that mystery Babylon, mother of harlots, popery, and prelacy for their corruption in doctrine, worship, discipline, and government, and did more particularly relate to the concerns of Christ's priestly office, which was transmitted from the Chaldees to the Lullards, and by them handed down to the instruments of reformation in the following period. Their testimony indeed was not active by way of forcible resistance against the sovereign powers, but passive by the way of confession and martyrdom, and sufferings and verbal contendings and witnessings against the prevailing corruptions of that time. And no wonder it should be so, and in this some way different from ours, because this was a dispensation of suffering, when Antichrist was on the ascendant, and they had no call or capacity to oppose him any other way, and were new spirited for his passive uh, for this excuse me passive testimony in which circumstances they are an excellent pattern for imitation but not an example for confutation of that principle of defensive resistance which they never contradicted and had never occasion to confirm by their practice 
but as in their managing their testimony, their manner was some way different from ours on this respect. So they had by far the advantage of us that their cause was so clearly stated upon the greatest heads of sufferings, having the clearest connection with the fundamentals of religion, yet we shall find in this period our heads of suffering some way homologated if we consider, first, that as they did faithfully keep and contend for the word of Christ's patience under the dispensation in asserting and maintaining both the verity of Christ's doctrine and the purity of his worship, by testifying against the corruptions, errors, idolatries, and superstitions of popery, so they did constantly bear witness against the usurpation and tyrannical domination of the anti-Christian prelates. And as the Chaldees did vigorously oppose their first introduction, and after aspiring domination, as well as the corruptions of their doctrines, as we have the contendings of the eminent witnesses recorded from age to age in the fourth and fifth age, Columbi, Libthak, Ethernen, Kintergen, Mungo, in the sixth and seventh age, Calmanus, Clemens, and Samson, and others, in the eighth and ninth age, Alcun, Rabanus, Maurus, Joannus, Scotus, Eregina, are noted in history. And the Lollards, by their examinations and testimonies, are found to have witnessed against the exercise of their power, and sometimes against the very nature of their power itself. So in their practice they condemned prelacy as well as popery, in that their ministers did, in much plainness, poverty, simplicity, humility, and equality, observe the institution of our Lord. And so far as their light served, and had occasion to inquire into this point, they acknowledge no officer in the house of God superior to a preaching minister, and according to this standard they rejected and craved reformation of exorbitant prelacy. And it is plain that they were frequently discovered by discountenancing and withdrawing from their superstitions and idolatrous worship, for all which, when they could not escape nor repel their violence, they cheerfully embraced and endured the flames. Secondly, that their adversaries did manage their cruel craft and crafty cruelty in murdering those servants of God much after the same method that ours do, except that they are many stages outdone by their successors, as much as perfect artists do outstrip the rude beginnings of apprentices. But, on the other hand, the sufferers in our day that would follow the example of those worthies under popery would be much condemned by this generation, even by them that commend the matter of their testimony, though they will not allow the manner of it to be imitated in this day. The adversaries of Christ in this and that generation are more alike than his confessors and witnesses are. The adversaries then, when constrained by diversions of the time's troubles, or when their designs were not ripe, pretended more moderation and aversation from severity. But no sooner got they the opportunity, which always they fought, but so soon they renewed the battle against Jesus Christ. So now, when they had seven abominations in their hearts and many cursed designs in their heads, they always spoke fairest. So now, when they that had a mind to execute their cruelty, they would resolve beforehand whom to pitch upon before conviction. So now, and when so resolved, the least pretense of a fault, obnoxious to their wicked law, would serve their design, so now they used when so now they used then to forge articles and falsely misrepresent their answers and declarations of their principles so now yet on the other hand if now poor sufferers should glory in that they are counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Christ as they did then if now they should suffer with as great cheerfulness for the smallest points of the greatest heads as they did then who endured the fr flames as gallantly for eating a goose upon Friday as others did for the doctrine of justification or purgatory or indulgences or worshipping of images and saints, if now they should speak for every truth in question, with all simplicity and plainness, without reserves or shifts, declining a testimony as they did, if they should supersede from all application to their enemies for favor, and not meddle with either petitioning or bonding with them as they did, nay, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection, then they might expect the severe censure of ignorant and precise fools as the most part who suffer are now counted.